We're in a space race with China. India is the first country in the world to land a spacecraft near the moon's south pole. Since the dawn of the space age, many countries have tried to explore and understand the mysteries of the moon. The original space race was driven by a political rivalry between the US and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. But since 2021, there has been a flurry of new activity with Russia, China, India, Japan, and the US sending rovers to the surface of the moon. Why have all these countries launched new lunar missions all at the same time? Is there something they're not telling us? What have they found? Join us as we discuss the real reasons why the world's superpowers are racing to the moon. Before we explain what's happening now, it's vital to understand what happened back in the 60s. The earliest forays into lunar exploration were a product of the ongoing Cold War, when the US and Soviet Union sent uncrewed spacecraft to orbit and land on the moon. In 1966, the Soviet spacecraft Luna 9 made history by becoming the first vehicle to safely land on the lunar surface. This small spacecraft carried scientific and communication equipment and captured ground-level photographs on the moon. Later that same year, Luna 10 was launched, becoming the first spacecraft to successfully orbit the moon. NASA also achieved a lunar milestone in 1966 by landing the first of its surveyor space probes on the moon's surface. That's one small step for man. These probes were equipped with cameras to explore the moon's terrain and tools for analyzing lunar rocks and soil. In the next two years, NASA launched five lunar orbiter missions. These orbiters circled the moon and meticulously mapped its surface, which was a crucial step toward the ultimate goal of sending astronauts to land on the lunar surface. The images and data collected by these orbiters covered nearly 99% of the moon's surface, identifying potential landing sites and significantly advancing the cause of space exploration. During this time, NASA was in a race to fulfill a promise made by President John F. Kennedy in 1961. We go into space because whatever mankind must undertake, free men must fully share. President Kennedy pledged that the United States would land a person on the moon before the end of the decade. The commitment led to the start of the Apollo program in the same year, which turned out to be the most expensive spaceflight effort in history. On July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin touched down in the Sea of Tranquility in the Lunar Lander Eagle, while astronaut Michael Collins orbited the moon in the command module Columbia. Armstrong, who pressed the first boot prints into the moon's surface, famously said, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The pair stayed on the moon's surface for 21 hours and 36 minutes before rendezvousing with Collins and heading back to Earth. Since then, there have been a lot of trials and failures to land on the moon for many other nations. Recently, India made history as the first country to land near the south pole of the moon with its Chandrayaan-3 lander on August 23, 2023. This also makes it the first country to land on the moon since China in 2020. The south pole of the moon is of particular interest as its surface, marked by craters, trenches, and pockets of ancient ice, haven't been visited until now. Now Japan is also aiming to join the elite club of lunar landers with its SLIM mission, which is designed to demonstrate high-precision landing technology. So why exactly are these countries going to the moon? Well, the answer is a mix of geopolitical muscle flexing and a new raw material found on the moon's surface. The material has shown the potential to be a near-limitless power source on Earth, but there is a catch. According to a 1967 UN treaty, no country can claim ownership of the moon a treaty endorsed by over 100 nations. Helium-3, a rare isotope of helium found abundantly on the moon but scarcely on Earth, holds potential as a fuel for nuclear fusion, a nearly limitless and environmentally friendly energy source. China, in particular, has expressed a keen interest in lunar helium-3. China's lunar exploration program, also known as the Chengs program, is a series of robotic missions to explore the moon and its resources. The program has four phases, orbiting, landing, sample return, and research base. The program has achieved several milestones such as the first soft landing on the far side of the moon, the first lunar sample return since 1976, and the discovery of a new mineral containing helium-3. Helium-3 is rare because it has two protons and one neutron in its nucleus. It is a potential fuel for fusion reactors, which could produce clean and abundant energy. 
However, helium-3 is very scarce on Earth, as most of it is blown away by the solar wind. On the other hand, the Moon has a large amount of helium-3 in its surface soil and has been bombarded by the solar winds for billions of years. China's plan to extract helium-3 from the Moon is based on scientific and strategic motives. Scientifically, China wants to advance its fusion technology and solve its energy demand for the future. Strategically, China wants to enhance its global influence and a future claim on the Moon. China's chief scientist of the lunar program, Ouyang Xingwan, has said that the Moon is so rich in helium-3 that it could solve humanity's energy demand for around 10,000 years, at least. He also estimated that 100 tons of helium-3 would be needed each year if nuclear fusion technology is applied to meet global energy demands. As you can see, there is an obvious incentive to extract this resource, and these countries are all vying for control. However, there are also some challenges and controversies associated with China's plan to extract helium-3 from the moon. First of all, mining helium-3 from the moon would require a lot of resources and technology, as well as international cooperation and regulation. The cost and feasibility of such a project are still uncertain and there may be environmental and ethical issues involved in exploiting the lunar resources. Secondly, fusion reactors that can use helium-3 fuel are still in the experimental stage, and they may not be commercially viable for decades. Moreover, helium-3 fusion requires much higher temperatures and pressures than conventional hydrogen fusion, which makes it more difficult to achieve and control. China, Russia, and the US, along with new entrants from India and Japan, all have plans to establish a base on the surface of the moon. When a lunar base is established, the next step is to lay claim and dominate the helium-3 market. However, these claims are not supported by any credible evidence of official statements, and they may be based on speculation or misinformation. In conclusion, China's lunar exploration program and its plan to extract helium-3 from the moon are ambitious and visionary endeavors that could have significant implications for the world's energy and geographical landscape. But the moon's surface still may have mysteries yet to be discovered. Despite years of study in the moon, each new mission brings fresh discoveries. For instance, Japan's Selene spacecraft and India's Chandrayaan-1 mission revealed new mission distributions on the lunar surface and explored areas rich in potential resources. One particularly exciting find has been the presence of water, ice, and other organic compounds in permanently shadowed regions of the moon that may never receive sunlight. If these resources exist in sufficient quantities, they could be valuable for generating fuel or supporting human settlement on the moon. This would significantly reduce the costs of transporting water from Earth to future missions. Of course, extracting these resources from environments as cold as minus 250 degrees Celsius presents immense engineering challenges. However, these challenges are driving the development of new technologies pushing the boundaries of what's possible in space exploration and resource utilization. They also make establishing a lunar base more viable as it could limit the need to bring water from Earth, while no one can claim the Moon as its own. It's clear that these countries are trying to set up bases on the Moon to show international superiority. By establishing a permanent presence on the Moon, these countries can demonstrate their technological and scientific prowess as well as their ability to explore and exploit the lunar resources. By controlling key locations on the moon, such as the poles or the far side, they can also gain strategic advantages, such as access to any water, ice, rare materials, or radio silence. By cooperating or competing with other countries on the moon, they can also influence their diplomatic relations and their status in the world. However, setting up bases on the moon also comes with challenges and risks. For instance, building and maintaining a lunar base requires a lot of resources, funding, and coordination, which may not be suitable or feasible in the long term. Operating on the moon also poses many hazards such as extreme temperatures, radiation, dust, micrometeorites, and lunar quakes. But these countries are hard at work to overcome these challenges, and this is the beauty of science. After a period of relative neglect, space exploration has once again become a driving force behind technological progress. It inspires people to become more involved in scientific and engineering pursuits and instills a sense of pride in their country's achievements. This was evident in the enthusiasm and motivation displayed at the recent International Astronautical Congress in Adelaide. Do you think these countries plan to set up bases in the name of science, or is it for their own geopolitical and economic advancements? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.